All right. Best paper nomination, another best paper nomination. This is work uh, on Unimorph. This is work from the MIT Media Lab. And we're going to give the presentation. Thanks. So if you thought the shape-changing example was really cool, this talk is all for you. Um, so I'm Felix Heiweck, uh, and on behalf of the four authors and the Tangible Media Group uh, of the MIT Media Lab, I'm going to present Unimorph, uh, a way of fabricating thin sheet shape-changing interfaces. Um, and you probably saw this already, but uh, at the Tangible Media Group, we talk a lot about uh, of this vision of radical atoms. So basically what we talk a lot about also is transformations. And one thing that usually comes up in that context is nature. Because nature transforms in awesome ways. And it does it kind of in a different way than we usually do it with like, not with very precise actuation, but kind of uh, the transformation being encoded into the material properties. And kind of this whole system powered by this raw energy that is usually the sun. Um, and by using not the light as nature usually does it through photosynthesis, um, I'm going to show you a composite that uses heat energy that the sun also can give uh, and kind of convert that into a transformation. So I'm going to cover three major areas here. One is about environmental actuation, so passive sheets that uh, react to changes in the environmental temperature. Then computational control or computational actuation, so where the environmental temperature doesn't have to change, but the um, uh, actuation is embedded right into the composite. And then for interface, you always need sensing. So um, I'll show you a way of how we can embed sensing and even microcontrollers uh, right onto the composite. So those are the three areas. Um, and one of the major goals of the project was actually to kind of create this thin shape-changing composite that is really cheap and made with accessible materials. Because if you look around, like all the other materials are kind of hard to get, actually. Um, then has a printable design, which is also hard to come around. And then has the possibility to embed electric components without any additional, real additional work. And kind of all of that leads to this idea of being able to democratize shape-changing interface and really enabling anybody with very simple tools to make those things. So let's dive into it. Environmental actuation. So uh, materials expand when they heat up, and they do that at different rates, right? Um, they're called the thermal expansion rates. Um, and when you combine two materials with different thermal expansion rates, they create, they actually transform as a composite. And that's called a unimorph actuation, and that's hence the name. Um, and you probably saw this around. This, is, this might be in your living room or somewhere in your house, uh, a thermostat. And inside, there's this bimetal coil that actually uses exactly that to transform and kind of act as a thermometer and switch, regulating the temperature in your house. Uh, and people use this in architecture to build these beautiful uh, pavilions. So Doris Kim Sung makes these pavilions that just powered by the energy of the sun actually transform. And if you look at the thermal expansion rates and the differences in thermal expansion rates that these materials have, usually it's copper and steel, and they're actually pretty close together, especially on that scale, I guess. Uh, but so if you go on McMaster Car, which is one of the major material platforms for me, and just went through all the uh, plastics and saw that they actually have a cover a really, really wide range, especially compared to the metal, right? Um, and so all of these materials are available in really thin foils, sometimes even already coming with an adhesive bag, so you can just basically sticker them together and they just create a composite. So I chose these two materials, the right one for obvious reasons, because it just has a crazy thermal expansion rate. It's called ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. I'm probably just going to call it PE from now on. Uh, and then on the left side, polyimide, also known as Kapton. Um, and there's one further on the left, which is polyester, but that's kind of brittle and doesn't really come in really thin sheets. So polyimide it was. Um, 
And if you just combine these two together, and I showed this example earlier, you can create something like a flower that actually just opens, powered by the, by the uh, heat that the light bulb uh, radiates. So if you don't want the whole room to heat up and kind of radiate all this heat, um, then you kind of want computational actuation, right? Um, and there's, there's some examples here. Um, shutters uh, and Morphe's are two good ones, and both of them basically use nitinol wires, which is the usual way that nitinol uh, exists in our landscape. And the problem with wires is that you basically have to craft it, and like, especially with the shutters project, you can actually see how each shutter kind of behaves differently because it's crafted. There's no computational way of doing these, uh, at least accessible ones. Um, so looking into the uh, well, self-assembly of robots. There's this one project that caught my eye by Felton, um, and the actuation that they use is non-reversible, so they use shrinking materials that once actuated just stay in that shape. But what they do is they composite it with flexible circuits that uh, use resistive heating. Um, and this is a very printable process. It's very well documented, and you can actually define how uh, even the, the bending angle of these self-assemblies. Um, so um, kind of revisiting the composite that I showed before, if you put a copper layer onto it and kind of create these resistive heating patterns, you can, just by applying current, actually bend these composites on, them, on their own. And you don't actually have to composite these two things together. There's actually this material called Pyrolux that DuPont sells, actually doesn't sell, but like, Give, a, give away in really, really large quantities as samples. Um, they also sell it, but. Um, uh, and this is capped on and copper already laminated together, and you get it in different thicknesses, and it makes the process so much easier to get, have this. Um, so some of the transformation primitives that you can make with this, the bending one I kind of showed already, you can see how the um, material only bends where the heating area, this little serpentine pattern is. Um, and then if you extend that pattern over the whole length of the composite, it actually curls up, that's how much it bends. And one of the applications that you can do with this is, you know, if using capacitive touch sensing on the left, just having these post-it notes that curl up um, and kind of cluster visually in front of you so you can focus on the things that you have to do. Um, and another thing that you can do is you can add stiffening materials, and like paper is actually already enough um, to kind of define the bending more and go from like this very organic bending into more of a hinging behavior. So you have uh, a very normal hinge on the left and then uh, this pyramid shape on the right. And one, one application for that would be where you have uh, this, this iPad cover that basically ambiently just opens and closes to notify you of, of a message that you got and even create new affordances just like putting an object on the top to mute the iPad. Um, so the actuation range of this basically is defined by the uh, working temperature of the polyethylene. 95 degrees is really high, but you, you don't really have to go there. It's like it actually works very well in the lower temperatures already. But if you go over it, and actually something interesting happens, which is you, uh, the polyethylene rearranges its molecular structure and effectively shrinks, and that kind of creates this new pre-curled neutral state um, that then from, in, usually you go from flat to curled, and now you go from kind of a pre-curled state into a flat sheet when you actuate it. So some of those things that you can do with that is basically having volumes that are, when, when not actuated, closed, and then when you actuate them, they open up. Um, so one of the major things about this is kind of documenting the fabrication process so other people can repeat it. Um, and it starts with the digital design, you can pretty much use anything that pr gets out a bitmap because you print whatever comes out of this. Mm, I use Eagle a lot because it's good for electronic components. Also for more expressive stuff, uh, After Effects, Photoshop is good. You can even use MS Paint or what I found very handy sometimes. You can actually just draw right onto the copper with a permanent marker and just etch it afterwards. So you, desi you design the pattern and then you print the pattern on a toner printer in this one. I'm going to show an, a little s different step on that later. 
and then you, you cut the, um, the printed parts out. And then you do something called a toner transfer, where you basically just apply heat and temperature uh, so uh, the, the toner goes from the paper to the copper. And then you create this bath of hydrogen peroxide and hydrochloric acid, which sounds scary, but actually you can buy it in your pharmacy and hardware store. Um, and the solution is completely reusable, so there's no real waste product here. Um, and then this is 100x. This takes about four minutes, so I didn't really have the time in this talk to let this run in full speed. Uh, but the, um, basically, you just etch anything away that is not protected by the toner, so you get this negative image. And then, yeah, you remove the toner. That's actually an optional step. It just looks nicer. Um, and then you tape down the laminate, and then you apply the ultra high molecular weight polyethylene PE. Uh, and the the nice thing is the, those things come in adhesive backed foil, so you really just like peel the backing off and put it on there. And then that's it. You apply current, and you uh, actually have a transformative, uh, flexible circuit in some ways. So those are the steps. And I chose those steps because this is for the toner printing uh, method, which toner printers usually are, exist in every office. But if you do have a solid ink printer, you can actually skip one of the most tedious steps, which is the toner transfer itself, and print right onto the copper. Um, and that way you get higher resolution and faster fabrication times. Um, and the printer costs, I think a new one costs around 500 bucks. So um, if you do that a lot, it might be worth it. Um, so, finally, sensing and control. Um, so, there's a bunch of prior work in sensing uh, flexible uh, thin sheet like uh, composites, like either the shape itself or just interaction. And all of these techniques are applicable to the composite that I showed here. Right? They're basically using conductive materials and yeah, you can just embed them into this shape changing, or embed the shape changing technique into those, however you want to see it. Um, and because it's a flexible circuit at the end, you can actually embed electric components right onto it, because that's, in the end, what it's actually made for, right? You can use pick and place machines or just do it hand manually. Um, and one thing that I did um, uh, to kind of measure the angle um, I also did the, the mutual capacitance thing, but I thought this was an interesting thing, where you put a little piece of velostat uh, right into the hinge, and velostat is a pressure-resistive uh, material, and so the pressure kind of rises depending on the angle of the, uh, of the material, so you can kind of create this um, closed-loop control where, you can, where the computer can sense the angle of the composite, and the composite can also be changed by the computer. And you can even do fully integrated uh, circuits. So this is an example of a, a six-leaf lamp that kind of has uh, the microcontroller, all the MOSFETs, all the, basically all the electronics on it, um, and also transforms. Um, you basically just have to plug it in and it works. Um, one example of this is a dynamic reading light that senses when it's too dark for you to read and then curls up uh, and shines the light right onto your book so you can continue reading. So some of the limitations and some future work that I might do. Uh, so uh, overheating is a problem. You can, you can address that with thermistors and, uh, well, uh, temperature sensors, but usually you're lazy and then you overheat the material and then it kind of, it kind of does weird things. And asymmetric behavior, called the cooling problem. Anybody who worked with thermal actuated uh, materials knows this. It's really easy to heat things up. It's kind of hard to um, cool things down. So you get very fast actuation in one di direction and kind of slow actuation in the other one. I played around with some techniques to address that and I documented them in the paper. Um, energy consumption is a thing. Um, it, is, it is not super uh, energy efficient, uh, but especially for prototyping, it works very well. Then I need to do more material characterization, and the active holding problem is kind of a thing where you basically have the problem that uh, going to a certain position is, takes a current, but then to hold it there, you also have to constantly apply current. Um, so the last two things to kind of address them, I already did some force tests. 
Um, and that actually gave me some interesting uh, insights, I thought. So one thing was that the, this, is, this is like the absolute maximum of current that you could ever give this. A two amp is very, very high. Um, and you, uh, you kind of get, but the, the force actually still raises with these, with these numbers, so there's kind of a, a nice curve that shows the more current you apply, the more force you get. And those forces are not super high, but they, they are really nice for what this composite is. Uh, and then the last one, the active holding problem, can actually be addressed by using other materials that also react to heat and change their stiffness, like SMPs or even the gel that we saw on, uh, on Monday. So you can basically have a shape-changing composite with a stiffness changing embedded and then use the shape-changing part to change the position and then the stiffness part to kind of lock it in. So, concluding, we have, I showed a thin film composite with different functional layers. Um, then we have, uh, I showed all the fabrication parts that we need for it. Um, and then uh, we kind of drew out this design space that kind of maps out the possibilities and design choices that you have when you work with Unimorph Composite. Um, I wasn't able to uh, cover everything, but um, you can find out more in the paper. Thanks a lot. All right, I'm sure lots of qu questions, and as you're getting access to the microphone, let me ask the first one. Um, so number one, I'm glad we talked about battery consumption here. It's two amps quite a bit. Um, yeah, yeah, one point. Mm. But I can see that. So how big was the battery that you used? Um, so, yeah. so usually I, I would actually just use an actual bench power supply. But if I used it for a battery, it actually works of like uh, the little 9-volt uh, blocks, okay. just not for very long. <laughs> so the other thing is I'm an engineer, and as the past 50 minutes I thought about the curling up, which sometimes you want and sometimes you don't want. And so in 15 minutes, the best I could think of was to make diagonal con connecting elements somehow that as the thing curls up, that gives you some sort of a sense of, you know, that tries to make sure that the two ends don't have a chance to kind of fold up irregularly. Because synchrony is an important thing for you. If you have synchrony in a control, you can make much more defined shapes. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I played around a little bit with, with kind of like more structural hinging shapes, like actually me mechanisms that kind of, kind of almost like exoskeletons around that. And that defines it a lot. But yeah, that, I didn't try specifically that technique. Sounds like a good thing to talk about that. All right. Um, so, the, so you're saying that these uh, forces are like in the, in the milli newtons? Yes. Yes. So, so is there enough force to, for example, bend a flexible display? That's something I've been interested in. A flexible what? A flexible display, like a FOLED, um, or, or flexible e-ink. Yeah. Uh, that depends on the size of the display, right? Because the, the bigger it is, the less force you actually need to, to bend it nicely. Um, oh, yeah, thanks. Um, but I, I think you would, you would get some, some nice, like you wouldn't get the same shape actuation, but you would get some shape actuation on a, a display. You would have to face the fact that you would probably also heat up the, the display itself. How, how, how hot does it get? Uh, how hot does it get? Uh, well, it's like in the 40, 50 degrees Celsius area. Okay, thanks. So you would have had time for one last question, if you like to. Patrick. Otherwise, I would make you... Patrick? Ah, okay, fantastic. Daniel, Daniel Abrahami from FXPAL. Great talk. I have a question about one of the limitations you said at the end was the energy consumption. You said, but this is good enough for prototyping. So my question to you is, if this is prototyping, what are the products? Oh, well, the produ products are anything that changes the shape, right? Like any thin film, you can, you can use nitinol sheets to get very similar results, but fabricating those is really, really hard, it turns out. So you, can, you could even basically prototype with this and then for like the final iteration, jump to uh, kind of milled nitinol sheets. That's what I was thinking of.